Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning. My name is Judd Devermont. I'm the director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to Strengthening US-African Partnerships on Education. We are honored to be jointly hosting this event with Howard University. The United States has a proud record of working with African universities and welcoming African students to America. Many of you may know the story of the Kennedy Airlift in 1959. Senator John F. Kennedy said, quote, opening our universities and college doors to several times as many African students as now come over this would be an investment which would be repaid to this country many times over in increased goodwill, trade, and national security. His family foundation, then later the United States government, assisted East African students seeking to study in the United States. And while President Obama's father was not a direct beneficiary, uh, beneficiary he was inspired and then joined, uh, went to go study at the University of Hawaii. Our education partnerships have been at the cornerstone of our relationship with the continent. It has advanced U.S. interests, enriching our society as well as African countries, and deepening ties between our people and African citizens. Since 1950, the United States has welcomed an estimated 1.6 million African students to colleges and universities. In 2019 alone, African students were estimated to have contributed 1.6 seven billion dollars to the U.S. economy. These partnerships also have contributed to the rise of many African leaders. In fact, 20 percent of current African leaders studied in the United States. If you know Malawian President Lazarus Chikwera, you know that he speaks with an American accent because of his time at Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois. And yet, despite all of these successes, it's not time to rest on our laurels. We need to continue to innovate deepen our ties and work with African counterparts to drive these relationships forward. You know, I think personally it's shameful that more African students now study in China than the United States, even though polling data says 71% of Africans prefer English as the international language for their children to learn in. So today, I hope that we're going to write the next chapter of U.S. educational partnerships, providing some bold ideas and new directions for the Biden administration. Specifically, we want to talk about how do we reopen our doors to African students, as well as encourage more African American students to travel to the region and learn about its history, politics, environment, and other subjects. How do we encourage more U.S. universities to open campuses on the continent, as well as offer joint degrees that are accredited by both U.S. and African universities? What are the prospects for expanding e-learning and online courses for African students to benefit from a U.S. education, even if they're not here in person. And fourth, of course, what are the specific opportunities to connect the African diaspora in the United States uh, with universities in the region? It's one of the reasons we're so delighted uh, to be partnering with Howard University because HBCUs should and will play a major role in this effort. Now that's a lot to ask in an hour long conversation, but I know we couldn't be better prepared with this panel. This is a group of people who really know uh, the African-American education sector, and they promise they're gonna put some fresh ideas on the table. So let me just quickly introduce our panelists. Dr. Tawana Coupe is the Vice Chancellor and Principal of University of Pretoria. He holds, a, he holds a Doctorate of Philosophy in Media Studies from the University of Oslo, Norway, and an Honorary Directorate in Humanities. He has a notable publication record, having authored journal articles and books in media studies and journalism. He's an active member of civil society organizations, including Ama Bugane, which is a center for investigative journalism, and he's the chairman of the Board of Media Monitoring uh, Africa. He also is the co-chair of the Australian Africa Universities Network. In addition to Tawana, we're gonna be joined by Professor Paul Zelewa, he is the vice chancellor, essentially the president, and the professor of humanities and social sciences at the university, excuse me, at the United States International University, Africa. His research projects conducted for the Carnegie Corporation 
of New York in 2011 to 2012, led to the establishment of the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program, which to date has sponsored more than almost 500 African-born academics in the United States and Canada to work with dozens of universities in six African countries. And I know Paul is gonna tell us a lot more about this exciting program. He holds a position of honorary professor at the University of Cape Town since 2006, a place where I studied when I was an undergrad, and at Nelson Mandela University in 2019. Finally, Dr. Jeanette Yarwood is the Senior Advisor to the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs at the Department of State, where she works on US policy priorities towards Sub-Saharan Africa. She also teaches courses at the George Washington University School of International Studies. Previously, she was the Staff Director of the House Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights, and International Organizations. Prior to joining the US House of Representatives, Dr. Yarwood was at the State Department's Foreign Service Institute, where she was the chair of the Sub-Saharan Africa Area Studies. Dr. Yarwood is a Fulbright scholar and holds a PhD in cultural anthropologies from the Graduate Center, City University of New York. And of course, my co-host and co-moderator, Dr. Krista Johnson is the director of the Center for African Studies at Howard University. Krista, let me hand it over to you to start with the mediation, the moderation, excuse me. Thank you very much, Judd. I appreciate that. And I just want to um, uh, thank CSIS for inviting us to, to partner and to co-host this event. Um, this is obviously a, a topic near and dear to our heart here at the Center for African Studies, the Department of African Studies at Howard, and really Howard University um, overall. As you um, can imagine, Howard has a long history of engagement with higher education uh, uh, in Africa uh, and numerous, numerous, two numerous partnerships um, to, to recite here. Um, the Howard administration was unable to join us today, but sends their greetings. And I do also just want to highlight that they're really keen to, to um, to learn what may come of this event. And of course, we really see this as a launch pad or a kind of a start, uh, the initiation of a, a conversation that we hope to continue in the coming months. Um, I did wanna just say a little bit about the Center for African Studies in our work, because I think that gives you a bit of an idea of um, really the nature of the Howard campus and the HBCU campus now, which will really, I think, um, uh, illuminate some of the possibilities and opportunities that, that that didn't exist and that we're really operating in a very different climate in many ways than we were say 10, 15, 20 years, certainly 50 years ago um, uh, when many of these programs were initiated. So as the Center for African Studies, this is a Title, uh, a title VI uh, National Resource Center funded by the Department of Education. So uh, one of the you know, primary initiatives of the federal government is to establish these uh, national resource centers. I wanna just tout some of our successes here at Howard. This year alone, we, um, in our virtual environment, we actually registered and had 772 students studying African languages at Howard University. And I'm pretty confident in saying that that's the largest, probably by far, the largest number of registered students on any campus, American campus in, in the United States, um, studying African languages. Um, and this is a diverse group of uh, students. We, we have uh, probably a comparable number of social science majors and science majors, biology, chemistry, and whatnot. A large percentage of our uh, students are communications majors and even business majors. And I just highlight that to say that uh, yeah, I think the ways in which we think about cultural exchange and you know, opportunities for engagement are really just so much broader now. And that just the cohort of students that we have on, on Howard's campus certainly um, requires, compels our administration and certainly the center as well to think differently and more creatively and really in, in novel ways about how to engage in the African continent because our students are doing that. <laughs> our students are very much doing that. Um, so without further ado though, I do wanna turn to, my, to our panelists and I wanna begin with Professor Coupe and just ask you or invite you to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the num numerous partnerships that you have established with uh, American universities and institutions. Uh, what kinds of partnerships are these? And if you could maybe share with us some of the no novel initiatives and activities, and also specifically, I know that you have a strong interest in already engagement with HBCUs, but perhaps give us some insights in terms of you know, what, what your partnerships and engagements with H HBCUs looks like. Thank you. 
Thank you, Christian. Thank good, good, good morning to you over there and good afternoon to both. Well, I think I have a huge passion for partnerships with U.S. universities. So just last week, I signed an agreement with, uh, with uh, Cornell and the previous week with Michigan State University, which has an alliance with 10 African universities, including the University of Pretoria uh, across the African continent. And there we do research related to agriculture and food and sustainable systems. The Cornell Agreement also covers some of the same territory, but more things, including developing online programs. Uh, I also, we also have uh, unique programs with the Fordham University in the Bronx, where we, our students join their master's, their master's degree in emerging markets, but remain University of Pretoria students. We have the same relationship with MIT, where University of Pretoria students go for a year to join MIT engineering programs and then come back and continue as University of Pretoria students. We teach a joint uh, degree on strategic business, understanding business in Africa, or a joint, yes, a joint component of an MBA with Harvard Business School. So there are many modalities that you could actually, and, and this is what I want to speak to at the end about how, what the Biden administration could do on Marshall Plan scale. But let me keep, get back to the HBUs because they have a specific, a specific um, a, a interest of me because I did African American history and Caribbean history and literature for my master's degree, all the way from the slave narratives to the, the latest modern literature. And I think that the parallels between, of course, the experience of Africans in Africa and African Americans is fairly unique. In South Africa, we're the equivalent of HPUs, almost 10 of them, because under the apartheid system, black people could not go to white universities. This was one of the white universities, if you like. Uh, I, I'm not exactly working at an HPU. However, we now have many students who historically would have to go to an HPU. And there's this sort of subtle hierarchies around that. And I think a collaboration between HPUs, South African HPUs and former white universities would quicken the process of transformation and historical engagement and exchange and, and, and give more meaning to diversity and inclusion. I have a partnership with the NYU around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Lisa Coleman, very good at that. And one of the things we want to crack is how to formally white universities practice genuine diversity inclusion on a global scale. So, 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 so I, when I was at Bits University, which is prior to this university, we launching that here. I launched a center for an African center for the study of the United States. That's when I first met Krista Johnson at Howard University, where I've been twice. And, and my mission there was how Howard University can partner us in the African Center for the Study of the United States. The simple cheeky idea is that just as, Af uh, just as Americans study Africa through centers like Christus Center for African Studies, Africans should study America and Americans through say, African centers for the study of the United States. But the collaborations there would be truly groundbreaking and fascinating. So if I may, Krista, so my bold idea is the following, is that um, what the Biden administration should do is simply launch a 10-year program. I know they'll get two terms. After that, uh, Kamala Harris will become the president and she can renew it for another 10 years. That's going to happen. So that, that's, there's no doubt about that. Now, what they should do that in that space then is all of the initiatives to mention, all of the things I mentioned, scale them up dramatically. So do the following. So mutually beneficial co-equal uh, programs, of course, would be dependent to some extent on US resources, but some universities like mine actually can put resources into programs. So design programs that range from both semester abroad programs all the way to joint degrees taught in hybrid mode. But they must genuinely include staff and students moving between US universities and also multiple flows. So I have a relationship with NYU already in Cornell. I want Howard in there, I want Spelman College, I want Morehouse in there. I want University of California Davis that are visiting me next week into that mix. Because then actually we disrupt many stereotypes and many histories that actually hinder the notion that knowledge knows no borders and boundaries and scholarship is genuinely global. And this is not the global, not just being Europe or North America, but being the rest of the, the, the whole world connected together by knowledge, transformative knowledge and impactful knowledge.
Thank you very much for those words, Professor um, Coupe. Um, let me move on uh, with uh, Professor Zeleza and just ask you to, to talk a bit about your, yes, your you know, groundbreaking work with the Carnegie African Diaspora um, Fellowship Program, but also the establishment of the Consortium of African Diaspora Fellowship uh, Program um, and your ideas about how that might be a model or something that can be scaled up uh, uh, to promote uh, greater partnership and, and collaboration between uh, American universities and, and African higher ed education institutions. Thank you. Oh, Professor Zeleza, you're still on mute. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was saying uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, and I was thanking you, uh, you know, uh, personally, Krista, um, as well as, of course, uh, the uh, privilege to be with my friend uh, Tawana uh, in this conversation. So let me talk about the Carnegie African Diaspora uh, Program. Uh, before I do that, uh, let me just share a little bit of the background, which touches on how uh, these projects uh, can, of course, be scaled up, as Dawana just said. So uh, of the, my personal interest in, uh, in Africa's global diasporas, both the historic as well as, of course, the new diasporas, uh, you know, derives from the fact that I'm a member of the new diaspora, uh, having lived in Canada and the United States for quite some time. Uh, and in 2005, I embarked on a project on Africa and its uh, diasporas, funded by the Ford Foundation, and visited 16 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, Europe and uh, Asia from 2006 and nine, uh, focusing on patterns of dispersal to those regions of Africans, uh, diaspora identity formation, and of course, patterns of engagement with the continent. Uh, and then following that in 2011 and 12, I was commissioned by the Carnegie Corporation of New York to undertake a uh, project on engagements between African born academics in Canada and the United States with African higher education institutions. Um, research was conducted, of course, in the two countries, as well as in East, West, and, uh, and uh, Southern Africa. Uh, out of that came a report uh, entitled Engagements Between African Diaspora Academics in the US and Canada and African Institutions of Higher Education, Perspectives from North America and Africa. And, and uh, it was presented at a convening at the C uh, Carnegie Corporation's uh, New York headquarters uh, involved other foundations, African higher education leaders, intergovernmental and international agencies. And out of that, uh, the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program uh, was uh, formed. And it has a very interesting structure, which is quite novel, at least at that time in 2015, uh, with uh, the corporation providing funding, uh, IIE, the Institute for International Education, uh, providing administrative support. Of course, they have a lot of experience having run the Fulbright uh, program for decades. And then an advisory council of prominent African academics and administrators providing policy direction. And my university in the US when I was in the US, and now Kenya, USIU Africa, uh, providing the uh, secretariat. And the program originally uh, operated in six countries, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and South Africa. In 2019, we added three others, uh, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Senegal, with universities belonging to the African Research Universities Alliance uh, being added. Uh, the program seeks to uh, you know, promote brand circulation. Uh, it focuses on curriculum co-development, collaborative research, and graduate student training and mentoring. Uh, demand for uh, fellowships comes from the African institutions, not the global north, which is uh, quite innovative in that sense. To date, the program has uh, you know, received 1,247 uh, project requests from 234 accredited African universities Altogether, we have offered 528 fellowships uh, uh, hosted by 168 universities in African countries. And data shows that the program has helped to build the capacities uh, of African higher education institutions by increasing curriculum offerings, uh, graduate uh, programming, and research production. Uh, for example, uh, up to 2018, uh, the data shows that uh, fellows had contributed to the development of uh, about 700 curricula. Um, 4,000 graduate students were mentored and over 300 research projects were accomplished. Based on the, this experience, uh, success and lessons uh, learned from the idea of, uh, this led to the idea of establishing the 1010 uh, program. Uh, the 1010 program is envisaged to sponsor 1,000 academics in the diaspora every year for 10 years. 
uh, the 1010 program was one of the priority areas, uh, eight of them identified uh, in the first African Higher Education Summit on revitalizing higher education uh, for Africa's future, uh, convened in Dakar in March uh, 2015. I, I happened to have been commissioned to write the framing paper and was part of the team that drafted the declaration and plan of uh, uh, action. Now, the, the term term program, you know, the, in the, if you read the declaration and plan of action, um, the African governments are expected to commit to certain key activities, as well as, of course, African higher education institutions. So for African governments, uh, they are expected to commit to a participatory approach uh, to planning and development with university leaders, uh, scholars on the continent, and scholars in the diaspora to build on existing models and to develop new structures of collaboration. And then also to seek out expertise from governments and institutions who have successfully navigated uh, diaspora engagement to identify models for adaptation, you know, uh, uh, for example, countries like India, uh, and invest in technological infrastructure uh, to facilitate distance learning and collaborations between African institutions and institutions served by the African academic diaspora, uh, and, and promote travel policies that facilitate uh, travel for those in the diaspora traveling to the continent for purposes of faculty collaboration and research with African institutions and scholars. And then on their part, the African higher education institutions are expected also to undertake certain actions, formalize mutually beneficial relationships uh, between institutions on the continent and those served by the African dia academic diaspora based on the notion of collaboration, collaborative ownership of processes, scholarship and curriculum development and uh, you know, provide increased institutional support for faculty and student exchanges through strategic institutional and organizational partnerships, fellowships, travel stipends, collaborative grant, uh, development, cost release, and cost sharing. And of course, um, you know, to acknowledge and seek out opportunities of multiple models of diaspora engagement around the world beyond the Atlantic regions and develop and implement strategic academic research plans for faculty that enhance and benefit both the diaspora and the continental academic communities. And of course, also ensure that processes encourage maximum visibility uh, of local and collaborative scholarship between the diaspora and continental uh, scholars. And again, also to invest in technological infrastructure. The, this, you know, the, it was understood at the summit and some of us who have done work on this, that um, education is, is, is a global and, uh, you know, and, and African agenda of great importance. Uh, we all know that uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, SDG4, focuses on education. The AU, uh, Africa's, uh, Africa Union's Agenda 2063, has the Continental Education Strategy for Africa, CESA, uh, 2016 to 2025. And through this, the, U, uh, the African Union is, is trying to reorient Africa's education and training systems to meet the knowledges, competences, skills, innovation and creativity required to nurture Africa's core values and promote sustainable development. And we all know that despite its rapid growth, higher education on the continent suffers from massive shortages of funding and faculty, low levels of quality and research productivity. For example, a report that just came out on Friday, last Friday by UNESCO, uh, the World Science Report, um, shows that Africa's share of scientific publications in 2019 was 3.5% compared to Asia, which is the leading part of the world in terms of research, uh, 48%. And our research expenditure on average is 0.59% uh, of uh, GDP compared to the world average of 1.79%. Uh, and our share of global R&D was 1.01% compared again to Asia, which is the leading uh, player, 45.72%. Uh, and also our investors, of course, suffer from poor governance, severe challenges of equity, inclusion, and diversity in terms of gender, class, ethnicity, race, region, religion, et cetera, and inequitable patterns of internationalization. Uh, there is need therefore for increased support for the higher education sector from all key stakeholders, governments, the private sector, civil society, international and intergovernmental organizations, and the diaspora itself, which is Africa's biggest donor. In 2019, for example, the new diaspora remitted $84.3 billion uh, more than any other source of uh, foreign money into the continent, whether China, the EU, or the United States. Also critical is, is vertical and horizontal diversification, differentiation, and of course, coordination within the sector in which some have to be 
research intensive that produce high levels of research and the human capital for the rest of the system. This is the background to the establishment and I'll close with this uh, of the establishment of the consortium uh, of African diaspora scholars programs. It was registered in 2019 uh, in Kenya as a limited liability company and incorporated in the United States as a 51C organization. The, uh, you know, uh, the consortium seeks to implement the 1010 program, extend and expand the benefits of uh, the, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the Carnegie program to all African countries and involve all African academic diasporas globally beyond North America and the African born diaspora. Its activities will also go beyond the three areas of focus under the, uh, under the Carnegie program and encompass higher education leadership development, which is an issue, uh, promotion of e-learning, which has become you know, uh, quite clear that we need to develop those capacities following COVID, uh, summer institutes or workshops on cutting edge themes, such as the future of work, artificial intelligence and machine learning, the digital economy and cyber resilience, the blue economy, climate change, you name it, extend networks beyond academics to practitioners, bringing in skills of diaspora doctors, engineers and architects, et cetera, and develop a global database of African diaspora academics in various fields that will enable uh, the consortium to serve as a clearing house that matches African institutions of higher learning with diaspora scholars without necessarily being the one that funds these collaborations and collaborate with regional partners and stakeholders in higher education to intensify the continental effort to strengthen human resource development and to support the scope of education and research partnerships uh, with universities and organizations, both within and outside Africa, some of the things that Taiwan was talking about. And engage, of course, foundations, bilateral and multilateral donors, African philanthropists, the private sector, and government for funds, mobilization, and sustainable support of, of the diaspora initiative. So what we expect uh, once we are fully running is to have 10,000 fellows uh, to support African university capacity building to generate over 100,000 PhD holders, 10,000 research projects, and over 20,000 curricula developed and all renewed. This will contribute enormously to strengthening research-based solutions to African economic and human resource development. The, art, uh, the benefits obviously outweigh the uh, costs. Uh, in terms of uh, funding, we have been spending 1.6 million in the Carnegie program annually on average uh, you know, involving 58 fellows per year. Uh, with the proposed consortium, the pro uh, uh, we think that it will cost us about 21 million a year to support 1,000 fellows and of course $210 million over the plan 10 years. And of course, there will need to be policy imperatives, developing immigration policies, including work uh, permit regimes that facilitate academic mobility from the diaspora and collaborations that strengthen south, south, south to south and north to south mobilities and engagements. And of course, it's also important for African universities to promote conducive working environment uh, to strengthen uh, you know, equity, diversity and inclusion that incorporates the diaspora. Thank you. Thank you very much, very Professor much. Zeleza. Wow, that's, uh, uh, you, you've given us a lot. And uh, obviously there are a number of uh, variables there that we that need to be unpacked and, and expanded on further. Unfortunately, we don't have time in this particular form, but we're going to do that moving forward. Let me just turn though quickly now to, to Dr. Yarwood. And I want to invite you to, to offer some remarks on how U.S. investment, collaboration, and partnership with African educational institutions advance the Biden-Harris agenda and their goals. And then also, if you could also say a little bit about um, the, the current set of activities that you intend to support and plan to support. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, uh, Judd, Howard University, and CSIS for inviting me. And on behalf of our Assistant Secretary of Affairs, Robert, uh, uh, Ambassador Robert Godek, it's a pleasure to be here with you. In my role as Senior Advisor, I provide recommendations on a variety of policy priorities towards Sub-Saharan Africa, including cultural and educational exchanges, um, as well as, and I'm, I'm particularly focused on this, opportunities for youth. Um, I will say that we're probably, you know, in terms of our new administration, just getting up and running. So I'll speak to some of the things we've got going on thus far. Um, I, you know, as I left the Hill, I, I, I was staff director of, uh, of the Africa subcommittee working with Karen Bass. 
um, as I left the Hill, it was really important um, to know that I was coming to the Africa Bureau where there are so many alumni of HBCUs that was particularly important and, and diversity was particularly important to me. And in fact, during my first week um, after I took the job, it was um, a good sign when our Vice President Kamala Harris opened the 12th Annual HBCU Foreign Policy Conference um, at the Department of State. Um, again, I kind of knew I was I was in the right place at the right time, and that meant a lot to me. And so I'm really happy to, you know, be able to work on some of these initiatives. Um, the Bureau has a longstanding commitment to HBCUs through discussions to promote their work in Africa through interactive exchanges, policy discussions with students and faculty at universities, including Texas Southern University, uh, Grambling, uh, oh, sorry, Southern University, Dillard, Grambling in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark Atlanta, Fisk, Fisk in Tennessee, Kentucky State University, Morgan State, uh, in Maryland and many others. As Judd mentioned, um, you know, uh, it's important that we're also engaging the diaspora, uh, recent diasporas and historic diasporas. And Afri um, AF uh, representatives regularly meet with Wrangell Fellows from Howard University to um, engage in, you know, discussions and mentoring um, with fellows from Howard University in particular. And I think that's, um, you know, something important that they do. Um, regarding, and to get back to, to your overall question, the U.S. has a long-standing engagement in Africa in health, education, economic development, humanitarian assistance, promoting democracy, advancing stabilization and human rights, supporting civil society, um, you know, and, and actively working with and engaging uh, youth, as you all may very well know, um, from the interim national security strategy, um, there's a particular emphasis for this administration on democracy, governance, human rights, rebuilding and strengthening our partnerships um, and alliances uh, across the world, and in particular, and and, and including um, Africa, and um, and African universities fits in here as well as youth engaging youth. Uh, Africa's population is young is growing fast and expected to top of 2 billion by 2050. That's why we're focused on this demographic in particular, um, because you know we all know that it, it's, it's an amazing and, and, and potential opportunity and or challenge if um, governments do not address uh, some of the critical policy priorities in, in, in their countries. Um, the opportunity they offer is dynamic, entrepreneurial, tech savvy, consumer generation, that can be the engine for growth. Um, they can steer their countries toward open, transparent, democratic societies uh, with a new generation of leadership committed to more inclusive and development models. Um, my own personal research has oftentimes looked at pro-democracy activists and young people tend to oftentimes be at the forefront of pushing for democracy. Um, and so we definitely want to make sure that we're working with this young generation. However, um, a challenge is that without jobs and opportunity, uh, of course, young people could be attracted to dangerous migration to Europe or the Middle East, um, and we certainly don't want that, or to um, violent extremist organizations that you know will definitely have a negative impact on the continent. Therefore, from our perspective, it's important to engage African youth at all levels um, across the board in our policy priorities. The Africa Bureau Signature Program, as many of you know, is uh, the African Leaders Initiative and or YALI. Um, and this year it celebrated, it, uh, in 2020, it celebrated its, uh, its 10th anniversary. By supporting YALI, the United States works with public, private, and civil society partners across the continent to develop initiatives and economic opportunities to harness the innovation and energy of Africa's youth. Since 2010, YALI has graduated more than 24,000 alumni uh, between the Washington Mandela Fellows uh, and re regional leadership fellows, um, centers across the continent. Uh, and membership in the online network is over 700,000 strong. And that's more than the population of Bujumbura. For the past decade, YALI has supported economic growth in Africa by empowering youth to take control of their own future. YALI promotes effective public administration, which we all know is critical, uh, grows networks that connect people, oftentimes 
you know, Rhett Bass and I would meet with the fellows. And one of the highlights of the program is that you get someone from South Africa, perhaps, you know, engaging with someone from Senegal, and they may have never met, you know, outside of something like this. It creates the conditions for peace, prosperity, and security across the continent and provides investment opportunities for U.S. businesses. Last month, the U.S. celebrated Yali at 10, um, you know, with a virtual summit, unfortunately, but hopefully one day, you know, in person again, um, and recognized the achievements, the really wonderful achievements over the course of the last 10 years of the um, alumni uh, and, and network members. The summit focused on new opportunities for skills development, networking, mentoring, collaboration, as well as the uh, opportunity for YALI alumni uh, to define a collective vision for the future. We definitely want to hear from you know, people who have participated in the program to help us understand how we can better and, uh, the program and grow the program, in fact. Um, another pro program focused on investing in youth um, includes English Access Micro Scholarship Program, which provides Eng English language skills through, Amer through an American lens to 14 to 18 year olds from uh, various sectors of society through after school classes and intensive summer sessions. The Pan Africa Youth Leadership Program offers approximately 150 high school students age 15 to 18 and educators from over 40 African countries the opportunity to explore the themes of civic education, youth leadership development, community engagement, and respect for diversity through a three-week intensive exchanges in the United States. Um, individual embassies tend to um, conduct youth outreach with local grants. Another key program, and I think probably um, extremely important for this discussion, um, focuses um, focused on young people is the University Partnership Initiative that the Africa Bureau launched in 2019. So far, we have developed 11 partnerships in seven countries and conducted 44 U.S. higher education institutions, um, connected um, 44 um, higher education institutions with 110 counterparts on the continent. The projects focus on increasing student and staff mobility using exchanges, joint research projects, particularly in STEM and agriculture areas, um, academic administration, and promoting public-private partnerships. The projects have also catalyzed over $700,000 in public and private funding. Um, I'm, we're doing a number of things across the continent. I'm just gonna give you two examples and my hope is that throughout the discussion, um, you know, I can, I can give you more examples, but what I'd really like to do is to hear some of the great ideas that are coming out here, um, you know, rather than just focus on what it is that we're doing. Um, in Botswana, the Rutgers Global Health Institute, the University of Botswana, and the Ministry of Health are piloting, piloting a telemedicine mentoring initiative on COVID-19 infection and disease management. The second phase of the pilot will inform expanded virtual learning, telehealth, and telemedicine initiatives. In Ghana, the first project for the Kwame Nkrumah um, University of Science and Technology and Texas International Education Consortium will develop online education and build the capacity of 30 administrators fac and faculty to deliver quality online learning. In the second project with the university, um, with that particular university and Iowa State University, um, they're going to partner um, to uh, address small scale community development projects for about 15,000 people. Those are just two examples. Um, as I mentioned, as we go along in our discussion, I can address more, but mostly I want to hear about a lot of the innovative ideas that are coming out because you know there is, this administration in particular has a commitment to youth to um, you know, rebuilding and strengthening our alliances. And so um, you know, we wanna think about the best ways to move forward in this, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yarwood. We are actually already getting some questions coming in from in the Q&A. So I wanna quickly turn it over to back to Judd to ask the second round of questions from our panelists and then we can hopefully uh, have an opportunity to, to engage in a bit of Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Krista. And uh, if you have questions for the panelists, it's very easy, just go to our website and you can click on a tab uh, to, um, to submit a question. And we've got some really good ones already in the queue. I think there's a couple of big takeaways from what we've heard so far. 
there's just a tremendous amount of programs that are already happening between African universities and really strong leadership from the US government in binding different communities, NGOs, private sector, public universities together. So we're gonna go now and try to be even bolder. And Dr. Coupe, you already set us up so well with, the, uh, with your 10 year program. I'm a little nervous to ask you to top it, but I do think there's some, the, some more things that we could say about where do we go with the um, public private partnerships, online courses, e-learning, and particularly thinking about Africa's role in the fourth industrial revolution. Do you have a big idea for us uh, within that dimension as well? Yes, I do. So let me just give you an example. At the University of Pretoria last year in February, we finished something called Engineering 4.0. Now this facility actually is for, for phase one of the facility that's complete. It's about smart transportation in African conditions. We use all sorts of uh, digital tools from artificial intelligence to internet of things to actually do road testing, road monitoring and say what conditions and what materials should you use for road building. Agencies like USAID and others will have, for example, partnerships where they sponsor road construction and related matters. China is big in that dimension. If you go to Kenya, they're building railways, ports, and all of those things. But with engineering 4.0, we're doing also several other things that people never thought of. Farmers want their produce actually not to be lost between uh, shipment to markets and even shipment for export. Later this week, a ship will arrive in Rotterdam carrying 3D printed avocados, including real avocados from a farm in a remote area in South Africa. But those, that, those avocados have, have uh, smart computers in them and they are telling us where the ship is, what's happening to the avocados and whether they'll reach market in good conditions. Exporting to Europe and the US is very important uh, business for South Africa. We're training young students in that space. So the, 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 the people running this experiment are actually our PhD students and they're publishing as they go. One of our partners in that is the University of California, Davis. They are doing something else, it's not the avocados. They want, they're doing an experiment on sunflowers. How do you measure how sunflowers turn with the sun? So our students created a small computer chip, put it at the back of the sunflower, and it's sending live data to University of California, Davis, and to anyone who can harvest the data and actually do research in, in, in real time. Now, I think that kind of stuff needs to be, to be really scaled up because it's, an, a, 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 it's a very realistic a use or, or re, very realistic and, and real life issue about fourth industrial revolution. Because often when people talk about fourth industrial revolution, it's the technology that mesmerizes people, but they don't see how it's its application in a context like Africa. But also what the engineering 4.0 guys have soon discovered is that it can't just be engineering. You have to bring in the social sciences and the humanities. Because how do small scale farmers who are women, for example, break into a market like this using very simple technologies adapted in a local environment and actually improving lives? And, and I think that, that those kinds of things scaled would, I think uh, if, if, if one likes, uh, I'm quite sure the Chinese would also watch this on YouTube, they, they'll hear me say that it could counter some of what the Chinese are doing. There's a question in the chat, which is, why is China attracting more African students than the US? What is hindering US educational leadership in Africa? Because the US actually had a head start on the African continent. Take Mich Michigan State University. It's been on the continent for 66 years. At the university where I went to for my undergrad, I'm Zimbabwean, although I live in South Africa. The Faculty of Agriculture at the University of Zimbabwe was built by Michigan State University. So anyone who's a top agricultural economist in Zimbabwe, and now they are spread across the world, were trained by US funding if you like. So now what's happening is that other global powers, China to a less extent, Russia are coming in there. US needs to recover its head start, right? And power forward. And actually in a sense, uh, because it also has more diverse, uh, much more diverse programs and a longer history. So I guess that is part of building back better, or I actually prefer building forward better <laughs> rather than back. You know? So, 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 and, and this can be done uh, if you like. That is why in my opening gambit, I said, US is already on the ground. What it needs to do is to scale up and to achieve critical mass because people know about the US and people, have, many Africans, as you said, and as Krista said, are educated in the US, 
right? This is not new. With China, there is a la language barrier. And I'm not saying that China should be excluded. Africa needs to have many partners. But I think that what the US built should not be lost and should actually be stepped up if you like. And this will, this, this will bode well for world peace, security, and multilateralism. I think the Biden administration is much more of a, less of a unipolar global power and more of a multilateral global power. That's very, very important for peace and security and for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Dr. Kupe, I love uh, build forward better. Uh, I really <laughs> like that. that, that we're going we're gonna to call the White House up, Jeanette, and we're going to ask them to change the branding. Um, I know I, those are exceptional points, and particularly, you know, how do we how do we think about Africa's contributions, not just uh, you know in the region, but globally? And I think the avocado example is a great one. Um, I want to um, shift to uh, Dr. Zalewa because I think you're doing some things that is about sort of regaining that head start that uh, Dr. Coupe mentioned. You know, USIU uh, is one of the few African universities that has U.S. accreditation. Um, and I think that's really important because we would like to see African students here in the United States, but we'd also like African students studying in African universities to have the, uh, the seal of approval of Afri American universities. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which you see governments and foundations really mobilizing their resources to, to help this collaboration, to make it deeper, to make it stronger. I know the U.S. Department of Education does give uh, NRC and, F and FLAS programming, but where do you see the future of, of the public-private partnership with the U.S. government playing a huge role in driving it? Sir, I think you're mute again. Don't leave all the good insights on the mute. We need to hear it all. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I said, let me build on what Tawana was saying. There is a tremendous amount of creativity and invention by young people on our campuses. Uh, just to give you an example, on our campus, four of our students won the global competition that is organized by Microsoft uh, by creating a very inventive um, gadget uh, that is called the Remote Well Baby. And, and it's supposed to monitor, uh, you know, um, babies' height, weight, skin conditions, and be able in real time to send that information to uh, if the mother is not there to the doctor and so on and so forth and and you know the competition uh, that microsoft does is an annual one 163 countries and our students uh, were number one uh, the first team from africa to win uh, that competition so there is an enormous amount of creativity and innovativeness among our students i think the issue is what tawana was saying how do we ensure we scale it up uh, and and how do we ensure that these collaborations are not only between the global north and the global south, but also within Africa. You know, I would love his students from Pretoria to work with our students here and vice versa. So we need to think about collaboration uh, in, 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 you know, in terms of intra-African collaborations between Africa and other regions in the global south. Uh, somebody talked about China. China is the you know, emerging colossus of the global economy and technologically, 44% of all investments in technology between 2014 and 2018, according to the World Science Report, were done by the Chinese. Uh, and, and now China, of course, and Asia is the leading, uh, Asia as a continent is the leading uh, um, in, in terms of expenditures on R&D and so on and so forth. So in terms of uh, partnerships, you know, I used to be director of the Center for African Studies at, uh, as Krista knows, at the University of Illinois for a very long time. So I, I happen to know quite well how, how um, the NRC National Research Center, as well as the FLAS work. I think something Krista said at the beginning is important as we think about these programs. I think we have to go beyond, uh, in terms of NRCs, uh, the traditional focus on the humanities and social sciences. Uh, as she noted rightly, so uh, not only are the young people coming to our campuses, or your campus is now, I'm no longer in the United States, um, uh, they, they, they have other interests. First of all, they have very you know, interdisciplinary interests. They don't see a contradiction between studying nuclear physics and dance. In my generation, we were one track. So we need to encourage 
interdisciplinarity, interprofessionalism, and so on, and, and go beyond uh, the social sciences and humanities uh, and, and, and really focus quite a lot on STEAM, as I call it, you know, not just STEM, uh, you know, science, technology, uh, arts, and, and mathematics, and so on. And in terms of fields, uh, you know, from what uh, Janet was sharing with us, a lot of the focus it really has to be on healthcare. Uh, it has to be in areas that make a difference uh, for our societies. And our societies, of course, as Janet noted, uh, these are very young societies, 60% below the age of uh, 25. So there is need to focus a lot on the health sciences uh, and also on the cutting edge technologies of the 21st century. The old uh, discourse in which Africa was good for uh, applied technology. You remember that discourse in the 1970s and 1980s? Uh, is, is frankly not on. Um, we need to be focusing uh, on cutting edge technologies as we focus on other uh, technologies that make a difference in people's lives. Uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, biotechnology, energy, you know, materials sciences, nanoscience, nanotechnology, all these areas, because the jobs of the 21st century are going to be uh, require these kinds of skills. Digitalization is a reality, and of course, COVID-19 has accelerated. The World Economic Forum did a report in October, which showed that uh, 87 million jobs are gonna disappear by 2025. But at the same time, 95 million new jobs are gonna be created. To what extent are we training our young people uh, on the continent uh, to be digitally savvy. And the African Development Bank, of course, has this huge program uh, to, you know, coding for employment. And our university is one of the pioneer institutions uh, working on that project. So I think for NRCs, focusing on areas that traditionally have not been the focus and the modalities of the collaboration, uh, I think, again, COVID-19 has shown us that physical mobilities are important, but it's not the only way to engage. So how do we use virtual uh, engagements, just like now, we are having a virtual conversation. Previously, we would have had uh, to buy a ticket for Tawana and myself to come to Washington, DC. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, of course, a little bit of that might be recovered after COVID, but we should use the experience of COVID-19 uh, to promote ways of engagement. Let me just uh, conclude by saying that, you know, as, as someone who was a you know, center director in the US for a long time, one of the things which I became very concerned about, and Krista knows some of my writings in this area, uh, is, is, is the need to make sure that our partnerships are founded on uh, ethical and mutually beneficial basis. Uh, a lot of partnerships between African institutions and Northern institutions uh, have uh, what I call the three Ps. Some of them are extremely paternalistic, assuming what Africans want and what Africans need. That leads to lack of ownership of any project. Once the money is gone, nobody cares for it and it's dead. Uh, people have to own it. So it has to be beyond paternalism. The other one is of course, prag uh, pragmatic partnerships in which uh, you know, usually it's situational, there is an opportunity. What can you get out of it? And what can we uh, also get out of it and so on? Uh, for me, the partnerships that I think are important uh, is what I call principled partnership in which there's true mutuality co-creation of projects. And that's why the Carnegie program is very innovative. Um, you know, the funder doesn't control the narrative. Uh, and, and you find uh, organizations such as the MasterCard Foundation now, you know, when they're developing uh, programs and we have, you know, uh, two big projects with MasterCard, uh, one for scholarships uh, that we signed last, uh, uh, last July for $63 million and another one on e-learning that we are collaborating with the MasterCard and 13 other investors in Africa, uh, as well as a couple outside Africa, including Arizona State. Um, uh, the, you know, the, their projects are based on the notion of co-creation. You don't write a proposal to the funder. You work with the funder on the parameters of the proposal. So I think relationships between African studies programs uh, and, and, Af uh, and uh, in the United States, as well as American universities, have to be based on this principle of co-creation. Jeanette, I don't envy you. Uh, you have some really uh, exciting and difficult ideas to sort of like to sort of shape into a policy. But you know, I think that the points that um, uh, 
Tawana and Paul have made about scale, about um, thinking beyond the humanities, about technology, healthcare, and I really like the, the three Ps and how do we have co-creation and be mutually beneficial are so important. So I, I'd like to get your reactions to some of these big ideas. I know you're not gonna give us any announcements here on a new Biden policy, but maybe a little preview of where you think we can go. And if, if I can, if I haven't given you enough already, I just two questions that I think are really important that we heard um, from the audience. One was from the Malawian Ministry of Education. Very excited to have open distance and e-learning and maybe you could talk a little bit about the future of that. And then just a general question from an African university staff member. How, does, how, do, how do they get involved? How does an African university that wants to be in these partnerships like the University of Pretoria, like USIU, how do they do that? That's a lot. Take what you want from that. That is a lot. Um, I have so many notes. I'm really excited to get onto this. Um, I happen, like I said, to be a person who can, um, you know, sort of really think through our U.S. sort of mid to longer term policy. I don't have to work on the immediate things, and so I'm going to bring all of this back to the bureau. But I'm going to go through a couple of the notes that I have um, before I, I talk about U.S. policy um, and where we're headed. You know, I think that you all have highlighted really important points. I mean, you talked about the historic U.S. engagement across the continent, really across the board, right? Um, uh, but, you know, here and, and, and in particular, thinking about academic institutions and, you know, my own personal research, I have done that research that looks at how a lot of the leaders did go to universities in the United States. And so I, I agree that it is critical to, um, to sort of make sure that we are scaling those up. I, I, one of the early things I did when I first started was, um, you know, have a meeting with our Educational and Cultural Affairs Bureau, and they had people from all over the continent letting me know what they're doing. And so I'm, I can't speak to all of those programs here, but I was extremely impressed by all of the things that, you know, to be honest with you, a lot of American citizens don't know that we're engaging in. Um, but one thing I heard when they were speaking to me was, and again, you all noted, was how because of COVID, we are able to reach people, you know, in, in ways that we were not able to before. Before, we probably needed people to either A, come to the U.S., or B, go to capitals, go into our American spaces or embassies. And now, to be honest with you, we are able to get to people out further in rural areas. I think that is critical. Um, it is not something that we should lose our momentum on. I think we need to build on that, right? And I think, um, you know, from those individual and small scale sort of um, engages, but also university to university. We no longer have to necessarily, um, you know, have students going back and forth, but that should be a component of what we do. Um, you know, you mentioned, I definitely like the three piece, took note of it, would love to have your, your, your slides, but something that is key and critical that you will hear from this administration is this idea of mutually beneficial, right? It is not just beneficial for African students to, um, you know, engage with the West or, or, or get academic, you know, Western academic curriculum, but it is also critical for us to have our young people engaging across the continent. Those exchanges are critical um, because they also become global citizens and allow us to not necessarily build back better, but perhaps build forward better, as someone else said. And so we're thinking through a lot of that. Um, and, and, and I'm happy that, you know, I mean, these are streams and strands that sort of come out through a lot of discussions, um, but you all have really, um, you know, thought this through. I've taken these notes um, and, and you'll, you're definitely going to see that. As you say, I will absolutely not be, um, you know, making any big policy announcements today because it's not my role to do so. Um, but I will tell you that we remain um, focused on engaging African youth, expanding that engagement, YALI is a most amazing program. But as I mentioned by highlighting some of the others, we really do want to expand that engagement across the board to a variety of types of young people. And we intend to do that across the continent. Um, we definitely want to um, expand upon and explore um, additional cultural exchanges and this university partnership you know, agreement, um, we definitely want to think about how to scale that up. Uh, several of you mentioned technology. 
uh, keep watching the space because we are definitely thinking through that and working on some policy that that you know uh, specifically you know engages, looks at, works with technology and um, the private sector, and try to bring it you know to a coherent um, develop a coherent type of program um, and so or initiative rather. And so you all will you know see some of these ideas already reflected um, in, in some of the things that you'll see coming forward. Um, so I, you know, I'm not revealing anything. I may not be saying much, but I think more than what I'm saying is I appreciate all of the feedback. Um, we are thinking about a lot of this, and I think that you all will see some of this reflected in our future um, programming. Uh, Judd and, 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 and Dr. Johnson, you should definitely um, make sure that you pass along my contact details to anybody really who, who wants to reach out and, 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 and send me some of these thoughts because, you know, we, we want to make sure that we are um, not necessarily developing things here in Washington, D.C., but really creating um, initiatives, policies, programs that make sense across the African continent. So I am open to everything and we'll bring it back to, um, to the Bureau as we think through policies and initiatives for this particular um, administration. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. And if I could just editorialize, I have been very impressed with the Biden-Harris administration, really looking to be innovative, to do new things. Um, I, I think what your your offer is truly genuine, and I've seen it in a, a number of sectors willing to take the relationship to the next level um, and try to think differently about our partnership. So it is, uh, it does observe the three Ps, or at least it's mindful of them. But maybe Krista, you can give us a little preview on what we want to do next. Like how how do you see Howard and CSIS continuing these, this conversation? Thank you, Judd. And thanks for everyone's comments. I mean, really some excellent uh, tidbits to, to really reflect on, but also to develop. So I, I think that's the direction that I would very much like to see our Howard CSIS partnership move in. I mean, I'll just, just say that um, the center and in particular the Department of African Studies at Howard has already planned or is already planning a larger conference on digital education in Africa for the fall. And so we hope to you know, be able to have, this was just a one hour event. That's actually, I think gonna be a two day event. So we'll really be able, I think to dive in more uh, deeply around the number of these issues which uh, and engage around a number of these issues which is gonna be great. In terms of uh, you know, our partnership and moving this forward, we are, and I appreciate Dr. Dr. Yarwood's um, um, remarks. And then also, I, I tend, I would also just echo, I'd say, with what, what Judd was saying, my engagement with a number of um, uh, U.S. government a, uh, agencies in state and education and whatnot has also seemed to be, in this new administration, they have been welcoming of our input and our uh, engagement. So I want to see us really um, develop that. And uh, Judd, I mean, Judd and CSIS, of course, already have a long history of writing editorials, putting thing, putting information in pithy, very straightforward and clear ways, which can you know, kind of attract um, an audience within government. So I would like to see us do that. Paul, as he said before, I mean, I know his, I do know his work quite well, and he has already actually written a number of things, which are maybe a little bit lengthy, but we could, we can pare that down to a few really great nuggets that I think will be useful. We're at kind of a, I mean, as I think Dr. Yarwood can probably speak to, we're at, um, um, we're at a turning point, but we're also in a little bit of a limbo in the sense that the budget has, or the budget proposal has just come out. I don't know if she wants to speak to any innovations in there. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, no, not really. Um, I, I have, you know, kind of read, quick, quickly read through the, the Department of Education because, of course, I'm interested in the Title VI uh, funding and, and whatnot. And there's some interesting um, pools, you know, of money that I'm not sure what, what, what are going to be used for. So I think we're at an interesting point where if we can get some ideas in front of policymakers, that this might be a really uh, a, a, a good opportunity to do that and then a good time to do that. So I, that's what I see us doing next, Jack. Well, I, I'm, I'm all for that. I, I think that one of the things that's really exciting about our partnership, Krista, is that you bring uh, the expertise in education and being an HBCU and having these relationships with, with you know, a number of universities on the campus, having so many African students. We can help bring uh, translate it into policy. And then Jeanette could tell us what makes sense and what doesn't. So 
I just want to say thank you uh, to Dr. Coupe and Dr. Uh, Zaleza, uh, to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Yarwood. I'm the only non-doctor here. I, that's been abundantly clear for this event. Um, but this has been an extraordinary conversation. Thank you to everyone who's watched online. We had great questions. We tried to get to as many as we could. Um, and this will be not the, the last time. This is the first time that we'll talk about this issue. So thank you so much for all your time. Have a great Monday. If you're here in the US, a great rest of your day. If you're on the continent, a great evening and thank you.